Welcome to our second installment of Chapter 6's discussion on lots of crazy stuff. In today's lecture, I'm going to be talking about particles and waves, which is really deep stuff. I'd like to take a moment, in fact, to go to my special mind palace before we begin. Now that I've done that, let's get started by reading a direct quote from our text. Quote, when solids are heated, they emit radiation, as seen in the red glow of an electric stove burner or the bright white light of tungsten light bulb. The distribution of the radiation depends on temperature. A red hot object, for instance, is cooler than a yellowish or white hot one. During the 1800s, a number of physicists studied this phenomenon, trying to understand the relationship between the temperature and the intensity or wavelength of the admitted radiation. So in 1900, a German physicist named Max Planck proposed that energy can either be released or absorbed by atoms only in discrete chunks of some minimum size. He gave the name quantum to the smallest quantity of energy that can be emitted or absorbed as electromagnetic radiation. He proposed that the energy E of a single quantum equals a constant times the frequency of radiation according to this equation. Energy equals some constant h, well this isn't really an h, it's some other symbol, multiplied by frequency. This term h is called Planck's constant, which happens to be equal to 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. Whew. That happens to be one of those values that I've used so many times that I've actually memorized it. And you can too, which brings us to some problems from our problem set. In part A it says, calculate the energy of a photon of electromagnetic radiation whose frequency is that crazy number. Part B says, what is the wavelength of radiation that has photons of energy that number of joules there? And another problem reads, one type of sunburn occurs through exposure to UV light of wavelength 325 nanometers. What is the energy of a photon of this wavelength? What is the energy of a mole of such photons? And how many photons are in a one millijoule burst of this radiation? I'm not going to do these problems in this video, but I will post a link somewhere on this slide, which if you click on will take you to a separate video in which I've worked these out. All right, with that said, let's go on. If we look at this figure from our book, we can imagine that if a man were walking up a ramp, his feet can be placed at any vertical level along this ramp, since a ramp slopes gradually. However, if we contrast this with a man that's walking up stairs, then his feet can really only be placed at specific vertical positions called steps. <laughs> he can, for example, be standing on step one or step two, but not in between steps one and two. So once again, that hopefully makes sense. If you're walking along a ramp, you could technically be at any vertical position, but along steps, you can't be, because you can't exist at a level that's between step one or step two unless you have the ability to float or something. So. Energy is kind of like this. It can only exist at specific energy levels, like steps, and not anywhere in between. This is why equation 6.2 that I showed you before works. Now, because energy can only exist at fixed levels, which we call quanta, which is the plural of quantum, we can say that energy is quantized. You keep your slimy tentacles off my planet. If you wanted to stop me, you should have done it when you possessed the quantonium. Now you're nothing. So sometime after Max Planck developed equation 6.2, experimental observations showed that depending on the circumstance, energy can sometimes behave like a wave and sometimes behave like a particle. So what's the difference between a particle and a wave? Well, particles are objects that have mass, and they behave according to classical physics. Things that strictly act like particles are not quantized. That is, they aren't limited to specific energy levels, or quanta. From a physics point of view, any object that has mass, from something as small as an electron to something as large as the sun, or even larger, can be treated like a particle. Now, things that have wave-like properties are said to be quantized, which means that they can only exist at incremental energy levels and not at in-between energy levels. Furthermore, their behavior doesn't really follow and typically can't be explained using classical physics. For right now, you can sort of imagine wave-like properties as just being 
kind of weird. So anywho, sometime after Planck developed equation 6.2 that we showed before, experimental observations showed that depending on the circumstance, energy can sometimes behave like a wave and also sometimes behave like a particle. In time, a physicist named Louis de Broglie proposed that the same could also be said of matter. In other words, he proposed that matter might also have both wave-like and particle-like properties. He created the following equation right here that related wavelength to matter. Wavelength is, of course, this symbol lambda. This uh, H, which is actually supposed to be H with a hat on it, and I couldn't find that uh, symbol when setting up my slides, is Planck's constant that we mentioned before. M is the object's mass, and V is the object's velocity. This is equation 6.8 from our text. So because the de Broglie relationship, this equation that I just barely showed you, applies to all matter, any object of mass m and velocity v would actually have wave-like character. However, if you look at equation 6.8, the one that I just showed, you can actually see that for any ordinary sized object, the mass would make the wave-like character lambda so tiny that it would really be almost unobservable. So when we talk about something that you'd actually interact with in real life, like an apple or a golf ball or a car, you're not going to see its wave-like properties be observable in any way because its mass is just way too big. However, for tiny particles such as an electron, their mass is so small that their wave-like characteristics can actually be quite significant. This fact is actually used in x-ray diffraction, which is a technique that happened to be utilized by Rosalind Franklin to help determine the structure of DNA. I invite you to look up more on that online. That takes us then to another set of problems. Use the de Broglie relationship to determine the wavelengths of the following objects. An 85 kilogram person skiing at this velocity, a 10 gram bullet fired at this velocity, or a lithium atom moving at that velocity. Once again, I'm not going to answer those in this video, but we'll post a link here somewhere on the screen that you can click on to take you to a separate video in which I uh, work these out. That concludes today's video. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Stay tuned for our next video in which we will talk about the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle and Boromir from Lord of the Rings. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.